Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week on the show, we'll be sharing a presentation by Dr. Medibo Kadale, recorded at the 2023 Another Carolina Anarchist Book Fair in so-called Asheville. Modibo is joined by his friend Andrew Zonnevald of On Our Own Authority Books. Then you'll hear Ian talk to Sarah and Josh, organizers from the Certain Days Collective, on the publication of this year's Certain Days Freedom for Political Prisoners calendar. The two discuss the creative and administrative processes involved in producing one of the most consistent projects in the abolitionist space. They also also discuss the past, present, and future of the project, and the constant need to balance short-term emergent issues against the long-term abolition goal. You can learn more at certaindays.org, find them on a bunch of social media platforms, and order their calendars for delivery in Canada via leftwingbooks.net or in the USA via burningbooks.com. You can also find our past conversations with Josh and other members of the collective, including Josh's recent interview about the book Rattling the Cage by going to our website and searching his name. If you're interested in getting to know a little bit about Especifismo, there's a program called Militant Kindergarten. It's a 15-week seminar starting in January on anarchist theory, strategy, and militancy using social anarchism and organization by the Anarchist Federation of Rio de Janeiro. Audiobook and study notes will be available. If you're interested, you can contact ESPECIFISMO studies at gmail.com specifismo studies at gmail.com just a quick announcement a reminder that the first sunday of every month in Asheville at firestorm books from 3 to 5 p.m blue ridge anarchist black cross has its letter writing night for prisoners we'll have names and addresses of folks that are currently incarcerated who either have upcoming birthdays who have been moved and might need a little support or who are suffering some repression that you can write to say hello make a friend and we'll have supplies there as well it's also a great way to meet folks who are involved in anarchist community and anti-prison struggle check it out firestorm first sunday of each month from 3 to 5 p.m this next time we'll be doing it on december 3rd see you there hello everyone um if you could just please introduce yourselves and tell us your uh pronouns and talk a little bit about your organizing backgrounds and how you came to be involved with certain days yeah josh why don't i put you on the spot first (laughs) sure my name is josh davidson he him pronouns Uh, I've been involved in the Certain Days Calendar Collective since about 2015 or so. I was invited by by David Gilbert, one of the founding members in prison, and some of the other collective members. And I've been involved ever since. I do a lot of other political prisoner work, uh, including the Children's Art Project with political prisoner Oso Blanco, where we take indigenous art and use that on greeting cards to raise money for the Zapatistas. And I also work in communications with the Zen Education Project. So I am Sarah Faulkner, she, her pronouns. I'm based in Hamilton, Ontario, the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas. Um, And I grew up not far from here in the smaller city of Stratford, a wonderful community in so many ways, but I had a lot to learn. And so in high school, a teacher introduced us to the family of Dudley George, an indigenous protester who was killed by police. That was almost 30 years ago now, I guess. And it really opened my eyes. And so in the early 2000s, when I moved to Montreal, which had a huge and vibrant anarchist community at the time, I became involved with people that were doing solidarity work. You know, I started writing to prisoners. I became involved in this wonderful group that had started the Certain Days calendar around then. And at first I was just distributing calendars with my partner, but I soon became involved in the collective um, and actually creating this beautiful thing. And so that's been you know, uh, well over 20 years now, which is amazing. Can you give a brief overview and maybe a little brief history of what the Certain Days Project is and maybe talk a little bit about how it has changed or even stayed the same uh, since its inception? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So the Certain Days Freedom for Political Prisoners calendar is a joint fundraising and educational project between outside organizers across North America and political prisoners in prison. Currently, the incarcerated 
uh, member within the collective, his name is Nachli. He's imprisoned in Texas, where he's been held um, in uh, solitary confinement for decades now. And the calendar was created over 20 years ago by three New York State political prisoners, Herman Bell, Robert Seth Hayes, and David Gilbert, David Gilbert, all of whom have been released as of 2018. And Sarah, do you want to you want to add more about the history of the calendar? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, Josh, you, you gave a great overview. And then just, I mean, Herman Bell, who was a Black liberation prisoner, um, I guess had been visiting with supporters from Montreal at the time. And it was his idea um, to create the calendar. It was a way to keep prisoners in front of people every day, 365 days a year. Here are prisoners on your wall, a way to learn about our history, even as we continue to shape it. Um, and Josh, you'll laugh because he said it to you, I'm sure, many times. He always said to me, anyone who doesn't have a certain day's calendar on their wall at home or at work is a square. <laughs> the major insult from Herman Bell, if you do not have one of these calendars, is that you are a square. And so, yeah, I think it really just grew from there. You know, um, David and Seth were involved for many years in shaping the project. And so many people contributed, including organizing members in New York. Uh, Baltimore, uh, now we've got Minneapolis and so many others um, across, you know, Canada and the States. That's a really interesting thing about the calendar to me too, is that it's this kind of like cross-border project in addition to being across generations, in addition to being across movements, you know, and uh, I can't let the history go by without mentioning our dear friend Daniel McGowan friend of this show who is i understand obsessed with rush and not so secretly wants to be a canadian so between all of us we have a lot of fun we build this thing you know uh and it's just been like a wonderful to see it grow and there's people that come in and out of the project over the years uh in such a, a wonderful way that it's just amazing to me that it's it's still going and it feels like it's going to keep going it strikes me as the kind of project where the the folks who leave it don't tend to uh, stray too far from it. You're so right. Like it, it, it's a collective that's quite small and it takes a lot of work. Um, in fact, I took a bit of a step back in the past couple of years um, because I had to focus on family and, you know, during COVID things were really challenging too. And so to be able to have that flexibility to take a bit of a step back, but still be so passionate about it and still involved and to still keep building it. Like I just, I really value that. And I, I love people that will step up to take on what they can in the meantime too, so that we can come in and out of it, you know, where we see fit. I don't know, Josh, like um, you've seen people come in and out of the project. You were such a wonderful, like infusion of energy when you came in too. And so I like, I wonder if you have any reflections on that. Yeah, it has really been interesting to watch it grow just in the, you know, the eight or seven or eight years that I've been involved. It's been really amazing to watch our inside, our founding inside collective members come home. I think that's something that I, you know, I never expected to see. So I'm so glad that they're outside fighting with us today. I think that's a major change that we've seen. But also, yeah, just to see new people join the collective, to see um, how people who were so intimately involved um, stay connected and stay involved in, in whatever capacity that they can. It, it's really breathtaking and it's really, you know, um, um, amazing to see, to be a part of. Uh, I'm really interested in the level of, of consistency you all have managed year on year. Can you discuss the, um, the assembly process, the writing process, the, I, I'm assuming it goes on kind of an annual schedule. Can you tell me a little bit about how that works? Uh, yeah, you're you're right. It is an annual schedule. It's it's kind of a full time job. We kind of joke about that, but but it's very true. You know, we we do spend. There's a small group of us doing it, and we do spend a lot of time making it happen. And that starts really before the new year. You know, the calendar is available to purchase now, um, but we are already thinking about what to do for the 2025 calendar and how that process begins. Um, and it is a really long process. That includes sending out a call out, you know, which gets, which, which gets people to send in artwork and essays that we then have to select and go through and, and pick out, you know, of the many that are 
submitted, we have to pick out only 12 pieces of art and 12 essays. So that in itself is a difficult process. I think because communication to prisoners takes such a long time um, and has so many barriers, the call out has to go very soon for content. So we're in the midst of like a high pressure time right now. There's only so many months that people think about buying a calendar <laughs> to those people that still think about buying a calendar. Um, and it's now, you know, and so we are really working to get the calendar to stores and distributors and to groups and just like people who love the project. At the same time, if we aren't thinking about next year's calendar, you know, as a collective, as if we aren't like getting in front of the prisoners who might send us our, our articles next year, they won't have time to get it to us and we won't have time to navigate all of the, you know, repressive conditions that they're under in terms of communication too. And so this is what's happening now. I'm sure the collective is thinking about what the next theme is going to be and how to get it out there in the spring. You're gathering those submissions, seeing where there's gaps in terms of representation, in terms of what they want to see as a vision. And then really soon after that, production's happening. You know, copy edits, layout, chasing people down for high res images. I'll give another shout out to Daniel on that one because <laughs> he was so good at it. Um, and, you know, it's all that so that the calendar can get to print and be in our hands in the fall. And then it just goes and goes and goes. So it's it's not a perfect process. Um, and I think at certain points it can feel very frustrating. And then every year the calendar comes out and it's just this like miracle when you're holding it in your hand. Like Josh, you feel this, right? Like you're just like, yeah, yeah. I'm, we made this, it happens. We're gonna do another one. <laughs> it's like <laughs> childbirth where you just get that amnesia. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'll just add that, you know, it's nice to hear that the that you see the consistency over the years in the calendars because every year we do try to update it and, and improve it in, you know, in different ways. Whether that's, you know, including photos of books instead of writing books out, adding more dates, you know, we're constantly changing dates. We were actually contemplating now of including the call out in the calendar itself so that every person that gets a calendar automatically you know, is aware of how and when to submit something. So yeah, we're I love that idea. Yeah, yeah, Good. we're constantly thinking about new ways to improve it. Well, can you talk a little bit about the uh, the call-out process as it exists now and um, maybe talk about the selection process? And um, I'm not sure if the contributors are, are prompted in any way. I mean, are you looking for uh, representation? Are you looking for timeliness? Yeah, yeah, we're looking for all of that. <laughs> Um, and I think that the call out process in itself has changed over the years. When I, when I joined, we had a theme each year, a specific theme, which was, which was considered and, and, you know, analyzed by collective members inside and out and, and essays and artwork were supposed to, you know, relate to that theme in the last two or two years, I believe we haven't had a theme and it's been a bit more open. Um, and that process has, it has had its in and outs and it's up, it's ups and downs, but it is, like Sarah said, it's an ever-ending process to get things to people inside while those who are incarcerating them are doing everything possible to prevent anything from getting to them. So that's something that we're constantly working against and, and working to, yeah. Sure. Well, and I think you know, you know that firsthand, Josh, because of this amazing book that you've recently released, Rattling the Cages, the, the challenges of trying to raise those voices and the importance of helping to break down those barriers. I think that's one of the most important things we can do as outside organizers is to find spaces to to bring those voices into our everyday work and to allow them to be part of what's happening in our current movements. And so I think, uh, you know, the calendar for the time that I've been involved with, that it has always prioritized prisoner artists and uh, writers at the same time we can't fill a whole calendar with that work and we get wonderful submissions from people who are supporters for people from different movements who are interested in just um you know like supporting the cause and so I, it's such a cool combination of, of both prisoners and outside supporters in terms of the collaborators how do you navigate the tension between emergent or urgent issues and speaking to the the bigger picture the long-term concerns of abolition i would say in a way it's like it's maybe it's almost a, a depressing answer but we are still dealing with many of the same issues 
that I was looking at when we started the calendar that the prisoners that we work with were tackling in their communities when they were imprisoned. The current issues and the issues we've been dealing with for 20 years plus and beyond, they're still connected. You know, so more than attention, I think it's about drawing continuity across the struggles. Colonialism, racism, sexism, homophobia, repression inside and outside of prison, something as vital and current right now as the Palestinian struggle. Like there's never been a calendar that didn't focus on that. And in every single issue of the calendar, as it always will be. And so I just, I think that it's uh, almost like a thread running through things to be able to show the history of the struggle that we're in the midst of. Yeah, yeah, that's beautifully said. And I think the calendar does a great job of that, of, you know, of showing that the, the struggle's the same, that, you know, these battles and our tactics might change over the years, but it's all the same struggle against imperialism and against all the things that Sarah mentioned before. Speaking to um, your comment about continuity, can you talk about how involved the founding members are in the production process and I guess the project in general? Um, and can you say a little bit about the intergenera intergenerational nature of abolition organizing, both in and out of incarceration? That was one of the things that struck me was sort of the the uh, transmission of of information of you know radical ideas across generations. Yeah, yeah, that's a great great question. I am um, I'm looking at a photo right now of Sarah and Daniel and I with uh, David Gilbert when we visited him in New York State Prison, mm -hmm. and you know that's I think so it's sweet. yeah I think it's it, it's fair to say that this calendar kind of grew out of that intergeneration intergenerational dialogue that happened between supporters um, and political prisoners 20, you know, 25 years ago. Um, and, and that conversation is still happening today. And, it, you know, I think we're growing and learning along with them. And like I said before, it's amazing to see our founding members outside, to be working with them on the outside. I'm going to see David in a few weeks in person, which will be like the first time I've ever seen him not behind prison walls. So, yeah, it, you know, it's an ever-growing and ever um, evolving process, but it's great to be in a part of that with, you know, with people who've been involved in struggle for so many decades. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent on that. I think like from its inception, like intergenerational relationships have been core to the project. I was in my twenties at the time and I'm hella old now. <laughs> like it was formative for me in my early years as an activist, just being in direct contact with people from the civil rights movement, from the black Panthers, from the American Indian movement, from direct action in Canada, from student groups and organizations around the world. You know, it, it, like, like it tethered me to the reality of our struggles and to how we can be part of still creating that better world that they were working towards. But to me, it, it keeps it very tangible. Um, it keeps me going in the hard times. And I hope that, you know, we can bring that excitement about this work to, to new people who join us. And I see a lot of growing awareness and interest in recent years around some of these issues. And I want the calendar to be a resource to them. You know, I think it's so important to bring people along with us. I see, you know, the, the value in, in all of that. And yeah, like how wonderful to have been able to meet and talk to them and write to them, you know, these voices that could have been lost while they were in prison. And then to be able to see David and Herman and Seth while he was still alive. Um, you know, he was quite close to us in Buffalo to, to be able to spend time with them like that. Like, I just, I feel so lucky to have that connection to people that still want to help uh, make the world a better place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just to add to that, what, you know, what Sarah had already mentioned, th this calendar, you know, it's also a, ca a catalyst for other projects and for, for us to learn and grow in other ways. And, and it helps in part to, um, to lead to this book that, that Sarah helped uh, us create called Rattling the Cages, Oral Histories of North American Political Prisoners, which is due out in, uh, in December with AK Press. And it's really a conversation, the same as the calendar, between people inside and outside, where I interviewed about 40 current or former political prisoners about how they survived and what they learned in prison. Um, Sarah wrote a really beautiful introduction. Angela Davis wrote a wrote a forward and you know it's a really 
it's a great book and I can't wait for people to read it and for also to people learn to learn about the calendar through it. Yeah, no, no pressure at all having to write something that Angela Davis appears in the page before <laughs> you. I was like, thanks. <laughs> but I'm so, I'm so proud and I'm just so excited. And I think just like to be able to raise those voices ah, in such a cool way. Like the book is beautiful. It's going to be, I think it's going to bring a lot more people into this work, which is so cool, Josh. In line with the goals of certain days, the upcoming publication of Rattling the Cages, can you say a little bit more about putting that book together? And also, um, could you maybe give an update on the upcoming release of Eric King? Sure. So this project was really kind of a, it started as a COVID project. Eric and I were reading a book together and he came up with the idea of, of writing to political prisoners to find out what they learned in prison, how they survived, you know, and what they see as far as the future of struggle for our movements. For those unaware, Eric King is an anti-fascist political prisoner. He's been doing 10 years in some of the roughest prisons in solitary confinement across America for a nonviolent act of protest um, during the after the police killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. And Eric is due to be released uh, from prison, from the ADX prison, which is the strictest, most um, secure prison in the U.S. He's due to be re released in February 2024. He is eligible to go to a halfway house now, but they do seem to be keeping him as long as humanly possible. But from, from this cage where he's been held, you know, uh, incommunicado from everyone, he came up with this idea and we reached out to as many people as possible. And we really got some amazing and, and beautiful responses. Thank you very much. Yeah. So along the lines of, of both of those projects, um, and I know that they are sort of maybe not necessarily competing priorities, but maybe overlapping ones, but how do you think about in terms of these projects, bringing new people into the movement um, versus demonstrating solidarity with those already in it? Like what, what constitutes a success along those lines, would you say? If that makes, does that yeah, make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, I think this is an interesting one. You know, I mean, I've seen so much change in recent years in the way we can talk about these issues with the so-called general public from horrible moments that have happened in the States, like the murder of George Floyd to the police brutality against houseless people here in Canada every day. I think more people are just seeing how broken it all is. I think a cab is hot on TikTok, and it should be. <laughs> you know, I think <laughs> there's a space right now to have these conversations about what abolition looks like, about it being this through line of history that's not just starting now. And I think, like you know, I like to see the calendar and the book as resources, so that as people are learning more, that they can come into that. I think also it's it's good timing for it because a lot of people in our movements are quite burnt out. You know, like it's, um, this is a fucked up and hard time to be organizing. And like, you know, I can't go without mentioning just like how hard it's been to organize around the Palestinian struggle um, in that space where I'm talking about how people seem like they've come further along with us. And then these conversations in recent weeks have been so difficult in the communities. And like, I realize we're not doing a good enough job of being out there and doing education and making connections, you know? And so I, it's just like a rambling way of saying it, like a feel hope, but it's hard. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned that people are kind of latching onto some of these ideas, but it, as, as they latch onto radical ideas, I think a lot of people are going to have to maybe drop some old uh, ideas. So one, um, one of the essays that really kind of struck me was the one from Pink Block Montreal. Um, so my question is, uh, drag defense has become a new front in the wider project of community defense. Um, I was struck by the comment in Pink Block Montreal's essay in which they stressed the priority of holding their radical position among liberals where they might be tasked with doing community defense at such as, you know, some kind of a, a drag event or something like that. As abolition enters the mainstream discourse, how do you think 
abolitionists will best bring people to a radical position rather than having that position be kind of diluted. You know, I, I love that piece in the calendar. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think I first saw it on North Shore Counter Info, which is a really, really great source of local information in Canada. And they share international news, too. It really moved me, you know. Um, in in Hamilton, we've out t- uh, at times recently been outnumbered by anti-trans and anti-drug protesters, which can be, like, quite demoralizing. But I see people showing up time after time. And I, as new people come in... I kind of want to meet them where they are, you know, like if somebody feels like they have an interest in being involved, but aren't quite sure about direct action. Like, I don't think you start at direct action. I certainly didn't coming from like a small community and you know, the, the values that I knew, I don't think I would have understood, you know, how important it was to stand up and to, to take risks for the things that we're doing now. And I think that's okay. I think people come into it where they are. Uh, like, and I think that's why it's important for us, like you know, to try and give space for people to develop that awareness and to, you know, give space for education and, you know, multiple perspectives along the way. That said, I don't think that we need to let people like block us from doing this stuff that's more active or from feeling confident in, like, direct action and the important things that need to happen right now. And so it's a striking that balance really between, you know, understanding that there's going to be new people there that may not understand all of the tactics and also not letting tactics be a thing that divides us. Yeah. And I, I just to add to that, I think the calendar does that really well by focusing on education rather than being antagonistic, you know, toward, towards liberals or such, or, or, you know, and I think by focusing on education, you know, we're allowing, we, you know, we're, we're focusing on this hidden history that you're not going to find in other calendars that you're not going to find in most places. The dates that are throughout our calendar have been submitted to us by people who have done decades in prison, you know, or, or books that are out of print, you know, that have obscure prison uprisings and things like that. So it's things that you're not going to find elsewhere. And I think it does, I think, you know, the calendar does a good job of providing an opening no matter what level of political consciousness you're at. I agree. And I learn something from it every single year. Like even doing the editing and pieces that we do, I always am like, oh, wow, that's so interesting. I didn't realize that I was connected to this other thing. I didn't realize it was on this day. You know, I just absolutely love that. And I think because of our wonderful artists and authors that contribute, you can get pulled in by just how gorgeous it is. Who doesn't want this like hopeful thing on the wall? Years ago, we made a bit of a design decision that we would feature art that felt in terms of color, tone, mostly hopeful, you know, like, because you have to look at it for a whole month. And so you can definitely do political art that's like quite intense or quite negative, and it's really important. But we try to, I think, still have uh, something that is just inspirational. And so, I like, if you're not, all the way there you don't have to be you can pick up the calendar and be like this is a nice looking calendar and then there's a lot of stuff to think about over the next 12 months and in that sense the you know the calendars really don't age you can pick up a calendar from 2010 and learn just as much as you would from picking up one today and i I think that's also just something that's really beautiful about the project itself to hear you describe it the project and the calendar itself have sort of been on the ascent since the beginning in terms of, you know, technical production and, and, you know, different qualities and honing, honing the message and so forth. What would constitute a leveling up for certain days, the project? Um, and what are your ambitions for the project in the short term and the long term? Hmm. There's a lot there. I think I could speak for Daniel when I say that we'd like to sell about a million copies a year. Um, <laughs> But it is, as we said, very laborious, and and there's only a handful of us putting this out every year. Sarah, what do you think? I think sustainability. You know, like this is a, a, there have been times where we looked at ourselves and said, do people still want a paper calendar? You know, given the fact that I have my calendar in my hand all the time. 
And the truth is, yes, you know, for people that want something beautiful on the wall, for people that want something that's like a little like slower or more thoughtful about the way that they um, engage with the calendar. I'll tell you, I haven't like I know people that still do it. I don't write in the calendar because I keep all my um, my dates in my phone. And that's just like how I engage with my my day to day. Um, so like, but to me, it still is so wonderful to like wake up every day and look at it, see what the occasion was, see what might have happened that that could inspire me. And I think that just like something tangible, you know, and uh, is still so cool. And so I like I still see a great deal of interest in it. And I think through word of mouth and through people who like have supported us, it can continue to grow. I recognize that it's out of size now that, you know, um, sustainability is kind of the, the key. So level up really is like 10 years from now, do we still have a paper calendar? I think that would be pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Uh, for my last question, the goal of abolition is obviously a very big goal, a very important goal. I imagine it might seem perpetually out of reach at times. So do you find that you're able to claim small or incremental victories in this fight? And um, if so, what are those? What what kind of keeps you going? Um, I think one, just getting that ca- ju- just getting the calendar into people in prison is is an accomplishment in and of itself. And knowing that people inside will learn and will share it um, with others inside. Sarah, what do you think? I mean, I think you pointed it out earlier, Josh, like the releases of prisoners that we've worked with, like for the past, you know, decades, that is so encouraging. And it's the work of people who have put so much, you know, blood, sweat and tears into these campaigns, into continuing to support them, into never letting those names be forgotten. And so I think the fact that people still continue to be released, that we can still put pressure on it whether it's for lease or for like better medical conditions or for whatever we need to do to keep pushing things forward. I think that that is like pretty amazing. I mean, repression is always tied to the the work that we're doing. It's tied to the fear that we're winning, that we're taking positive steps, you know, just like the, the situation in Canada is different, but um, you know, repression is still ongoing here. Like just last night here in Ontario, there were activists raided in their homes related to solidarity for Gaza. It's terrifying. It's bullshit. And we need to keep standing up and to keep raising these voices to let people know that they're not forgotten, whether they're in jail or in prison. And I think that goes for activists across all of our movements, whether they've been in for, you know, the horrible decades that some of these folks have, or whether they're just like new in this system to let them know that there is a movement out here that is not going to let them be forgotten and not going to let it happen. I think that that like, to me feels like something that we can keep striving for. Thank you both so much for the work that you did on this and for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. The final straw is a proud member of the channel zero network of anarchist podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. I'm going to make those pompous academics regret kicking up such a genius. Deciding to build my lab and do my research. The Time Talks Podcast. Have you ever stared at a 500-page book and wish you could just talk to the author about their ideas instead? If so, the Time Talks Podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network, is for you. Where we discuss history, politics, music, and art with an anti-authoritarian and anarchist perspective. The Time Talks Podcast. What's this light? I feel different. The Time Talks Podcast. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf support. The following is a presentation recorded on Saturday, August 12th, 2023 at the 4th Another Carolina Anarchist Book Fair in so-called Asheville, North Carolina. More recordings can be found at acabookfair.noblogs.org. 
a scholar activist with over 60 years of experience in civil rights, black power, pan-African, and social ecology movements will discuss the role of critical historiography in the study and documentation of directly democratic communities across human history in conversation with friend and collaborator Andrew Zonneveld. Modibo Kodali's presentation will touch on ideas discussed in his two most recent books, Pan-African Social Ecology and Intimate Direct Democracy. Dr. Kodali will also discuss his upcoming book tentatively titled State Creep, a critical historiography. Welcome everyone. Thank you for all your participation at the book fair. I'm really happy to see you all here and I'm really excited for this talk. We have um, Andrew Zonneveld who's an editor of uh, uh, Honor and Authority Press and edited books with Modibo Academy who's a returning speaker for our uh, book fair and we're really honored to have him here. And I'll let Andrew uh, introduce Modibo further, but thank you so much for being part of this again. And, thank you. And also, uh, Andrew and Modibo have a bookstore in Decatur, Georgia. Uh, and Stone Mountain. Oh, wow. Stone Mountain, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Community Books. And they, they also organize the book fair in Atlanta, so uh, inspirations for us. So thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm going to be really brief and introduce our um, uh, honored speaker. Uh, but, um, and I hope you don't mind, I'm just gonna, I like what I wrote on the back of this book, so I'm just gonna... Oh, read it. <laughs> <laughs> here's the words, here's the words. Um, very briefly, Modibo Kadali is a social ecologist, academic, and lifelong radical organizer. In the 1970s, he was a member of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and the African Liberation Support Committee, and a delegate, and a delegate to the uh, Sixth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania. Uh, he's also the author of several books, and I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about those, and then Modibo's going to tell you a lot more about them, and then, just quickly, and then uh, we're going to hear from some of your uh, uh, new research that's going into the next book that's coming out. Um, so, uh, the first book, we have one copy left of, uh, this was uh, a big collection of Modibo's kind of um, notebook writings from the 70s dealing with uh, a lot of the various movements he was involved in then at that time. A um, lot of stuff on uh, Pan-Africanism uh, and the African Liberation Support Committee. Uh, just a treasure trove of primary source documents. And that's that's what this one is, and uh, we might reference it later. So this one, uh, his students compiled, edited, compiled, edited, and published back in 2000. Yeah. Uh, correct, that's correct, right. yeah. Um, as before we knew each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> about a, de a decade later, when we when we met, and eventually we can we conspired to do various different things, but then eventually we um, put out. A, well, we started a publishing company in 2012, 12. and um, and I was on our own authority publishing, and that's that's our little logo oh, over there. Yeah. Um, and we published several books before we did anything of Modibo's, but one of the earliest books we published was by um, Kimathi Muhammad, who was a um, close comrade of Modibo's, and he wrote a very influential pamphlet called Organization and Spontaneity. Um, and I, I regret that we are uh, fresh out of these. <laughs> but we have, we have this one. Um, and uh, you can also find, find them on our website. Um, but um, yeah, so this was one of the earliest books that we uh, printed together, um, and Modibo might talk a little bit about. And then some years passed doing a lot of other things, and throughout all of, you know, from like say 2012 to 2019 when we put out this book, we had been doing a lot of like uh, community talks and gatherings just like this, uh, around, mostly around the Atlanta area, but also elsewhere. And um, Modibo was working on a manuscript at the time, but while he was working on that, I started digging through all of the recordings we had from all the, con the conversations and, and uh, lectures and stuff like that, and realized that we could, we had a book there, we could transcribe a, a, a book from that. And so while Modibo was working on this book, we went ahead and put out this book. So this was the first book of his that we, that we published recently. Um, and this is Pan-African Social Ecology, Speeches, Conversations, and Essays, um, which focuses a lot on Modibo's lifetime of activism, um, and as, as well as uh, just insights into various movements and stuff that were going on at the time uh, when this was published. Um, and it's got 
couple interviews and a lot of uh, other kind of public talks and stuff transcribed in there. A lot of great photos. Um, so that's a, a great book. This was, people seem to like this book, and that was really nice, and um, uh, uh, it felt good that people received it so well, and, and I think it, for a lot of folks, it was a reintroduction to your work. Um, uh, and then so, most recently we published uh, Intimate Direct Democracy. Um, subtitle is Fort Mose, The Great Dismal Swamp and the Human Quest for Freedom. And this is more of a monograph. This is a, a, a piece of writing on history, and really historiography, um, where Modibo is looking at two maroon communities, Fort Mose and the Great Dismal Swamp, comparing those, and through that study, asking critical questions about the meaning of history and how we understand uh, how, where history is written from and, and, and uh, what the study of history has to, to teach us in our activism and, and so forth. And yeah, so if you're interested in any, any of those books, we'll, we can uh, hook you up over here after the, after the talk. And um, usually when we have these conversations, Modi was going to probably talk a little bit about, about these works and um, his upcoming research, which is uh, well, I won't, I won't spoil it, but, <laughs> but um, and then we just kind of open the floor for questions and, and get some conversation going. But yeah, so without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Modibo Kadali. Well, I'm glad to be here, and to the organizers, thank you. Uh, I was here before, but it wasn't this good. <laughs> it seemed like it's getting better and better every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. I mean, that, that shows good work. And we've been inspired by the work of this community here, and people coming from far and near just to be with us. Isn't that something? Well, I want to just take, me, take you back through a journey that I had. Uh, this book right here is called Internationalism, Pan-Africanism, and the Struggle of Social Classes. What was happening during this time of the early 1970s is that there were a lot of Pan-Africanists who thought that all, all black people were the same people and there were no classes. And they were looking at the uh, state as the way to liberate ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I tried to address a little bit of that in their own words and stuff in this. And uh, this book was very, is very thick. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, here. This book is very thick. And uh, it has about three different sections in it. And it answers some critical questions, like I was wondering why did capitalism begin in Europe? And then uh, it didn't begin in Africa, it didn't begin in China, though China was a highly developed feudal society. And then I began, and I, in order to answer the question, I had to re-ask the question. The question wasn't why did capitalism begin, or why did it begin in Europe? I found out that it began on four continents simultaneously. Mm -hmm. you know, but I had to go through that process. So I wanted y'all to, uh, you know, when, you, when you're thinking about things, write it down and follow your stuff and get yourself out of these conundrums. <laughs> you know, they, they, can, they can be just drowning sometimes. And then I joined the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, which was one of the, if you look at the history books, they will say it's one of the premier black radical organizations of the black power movement out of Detroit. The organization that I was a part of was highly hierarchical. They had the leaders and they had us. And they had the middle people, we did the grunt work and everything. But the leaders were the ones that the uh, newspapers were interviewing, they would have been the ones on television. And then it occurred to me that that was how the history was being written. And that's not where the history was taking place. So we published a critique of the League, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, and uh, Kimothy and myself, Kimothy is a friend of mine who I didn't even know was a friend because he's from Savannah. I'm from, originally from Savannah, Georgia. And he was in Lansing and I was in, uh, that's why I ask y'all sometimes, you know, you notice I ask guys, where the hell are y'all from? <laughs> <laughs> I might know you, I might know who your mama is, I don't know, you know what I mean? But the point is, I found out that this young man, his name was Stanley McClinton. I didn't know Stanley. But then I was Edward C. Cooper at the time. Mm -hmm. He didn't know Edward C. Cooper. <laughs> but Kimothy and Modibo met. <laughs> and this book right here is called Spontaneity 
an organization. We wondered why. This is this is this is what we figured out. There are people of the late 1960s, which y'all read about. You see it on TV. You see people burning, looting, and all that kind of shit. Then all of a sudden, all these people started organizing. There was this organization and that organization and the other organization. And all of a sudden, things start, stopped. And then we began to realize that it was these very organizations that was throttling the social movement. So we wanted to figure out what is the relationship between organization and spontaneity. We should have put spontaneity in organization. But I think we did have it like that. I don't know how it came. The like conference that. was spontaneity <laughs> organization. The conference was that. The was organization That's what I was wondering. Why yeah. the shit is it like that? <laughs> <laughs> you had a conference. Too. Yeah, we did have the, have the conference. And Kimothi wrote a pamphlet. And by the way, if you notice, we, we put this thing here aside. We don't need this. We need to just sit down and talk. You know what I mean? This is in the way of people talking. So um, we had a, a conference. Kimothi presented his critique of the league and showed how they, they, it, was, it was not going to work. And he did, he did a good job. We said that within 10, 15 years, all these vanguard parties, all these organizations, the Marxist movement, this Marxist they will fall apart. And of course, you all witnessed it. It's, it's falling apart. <laughs> and then there was a, a, a hiatus that I was trying to figure out what happened. That's like a lot of people figuring out, trying to figure out what happened. And uh, but I mean, I had I had written some essays. These essays are in this book. These books, this book controls so those those essays. But we came out with this book, and this really, it really is Andrew's book. Andrew would follow me around with a mic just like this. <laughs> you know, follow me around, follow me around. And then he called me up, he said, man, we got a book here. Yeah. I said, what? <laughs> and, he, and then he said, our problem was trying to unite Pan-Africanism, you know, with, no, that's not the book. Yeah, that's the book. Yeah. Pan-Africanism with social ecology. C.L.R. James, who was, a pan, who was something called a Pan-Africanist, was talking against the state. But he was not associated, and he, nothing in his writing about social ecology at all. But Bushkin, who was a former trot, he was a social ecologist, but nothing in his thing about Pan Africanism at all. So Andrew came up with the idea we ought to name this Pan African Social Ecology to hook the thing up so people would understand that it was the same movement. Point of clarity, I stole the term from you. That was, that's your term. I just picked I know, it up. I know it's in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But he, he's a nice guy. You know, he's, he's, I'm just trying to be honest. No, no, we, we, that's what makes it work so well. Because when they read the book, they're going to see, oh, Modilo said it, not him. <laughs> yeah, 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 but I said it. <laughs> but he, he titled the book. Yeah. That's the thing about it. He titled the book and organized, he edited the essays and organized the essays. It's a hell of a book, really. But it's, he, he did it. I, he just used me. <laughs> <laughs> But well, th I'm thankful that he used me. <laughs> In this next one here, he kept insisting that I write something about the Dismal Swamp. Uh, well, you, you were already working on that. I know, I know, but I wasn't. <laughs> I didn't want to tell him, I'm sorry. But, but, but I, was, I, I, I was saying to myself, it, it, that's not going to be nothing with, with the shit. Uh -huh. People don't want to hear nothing about the Great Dismal Swamp. Up all with, with a bunch of land and Eastern North Carolina and Southern Southeastern Virginia, but I did know about the um, about the about the Fort Mose. Mm -hmm. And so what I did, I started digging and digging and digging and digging, and then I realized because I was already committed to direct democracy, I knew that direct democracy was the only way we have out of this thing. You know, I I knew that, but I did not know that the Great Dismal Swamp. Th this book here catches on real good. People love this book. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to still figure it out. So I, I go back and read it, you know, and read it. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> no, it, it flows well. And I was telling, uh, oh, what's Adam. Your name? Adam, Adam. I was telling Adam and some of y'all, I was saying to myself, when I read my stuff, I go back and say to myself, you don't know this guy. You don't even know none of his relatives. You don't know nothing about him. Plus, you heard bad things about him. <laughs> and the book ain't shit. So read it and see what you think. 
So I did that. I sat down and read it. And uh, I said, damn, well, all these people, they, they didn't have it right. This was all right book. <laughs> this is all right. What do you think? I, I mean, you Yo, I love that book. I, I thought, like, I, well, I thought the whole process that we went through for that, because we, we took a long time on that project, because, like I said before, it was that was something you were working on even before we published the... Uh, yeah, I'd uh, gone to the swamp, gone on yeah. to Fort Jose, went back to the swamp, went down to Fort We did a lot of field work. Yeah, he got his kayak, he got his kayak going down there. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, you know, a little, uh, we followed up on as much geographically as we yeah, can. Yeah. Oh, he's um, a map freak too. Map. He loves maps. <laughs> well, we, yeah, so we, we, we compiled some maps from other sources. Uh, yeah. um, uh, shout out to Margo for, yeah, for yeah, Margo, she wrote, she making one of the maps, maps in there. Um, yeah, it was, it's, a, it's a remarkable little book. It, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, it holds up. And like we went, I mean, we were in it on the editorial process on that. We were going back and forth. Like, you know, it's got to be like this. You're like, oh, it's got to be like, you know, we, 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 we butted heads a couple times on a couple pieces, and then... I don't even remember the butting heads part. But we it, 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 it resulted in clarity. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a collaborative well, effort. No, butting heads is the wrong term, I think. No, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know. No, we were, we were, we were working together closely, yeah. Yeah. and we had disagreements of opinion here and there. Yeah. And we, some of us conceded here. <laughs> Conceded there, yeah. like on the Zapatistas. Now, I, you know, that's, 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 that's the other book. Yeah. Well, anyway, well, I agree with everything you wrote about the Zapatistas. In that <laughs> you always say that there was a disagreement. But I thought it was. I thought it was. Uh, it was a conversation. Yeah, that, well, the that, Zapatistas evolved. Yeah, yeah. To, to a place where they are now. But at first, they yeah. were regular Marxist, Leninist, nationalist organizations. Right. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to put forth. That the organizations could evolve. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give them a chance, just like people evolve. Now, I'm going to tell you the work I'm going to enter now. This one is called Critical Historiography and State Creep. <laughs> this, this is the bomb, this one. <laughs> I'm going to read you the introduction from section first. Well, look, you got you to gotta like your stuff. <laughs> if you're writing it, you got to yes. really like your stuff now. And I'm not ego tripping or anything. Uh, I wouldn't put it out if I didn't like it. You know what I mean? And, and, and I, if I wouldn't enjoy reading it, I'm, I'm sure the musicians enjoy listening to them playing music, you know? So I'm going to read you the prospectus from the first section. Oh, shit, I, I had it on the screen here. Let me see. All right. I think, too, like, one of the... Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, it's right there. Oh, yeah, oh, you're right. Yeah. Okay. This is the prospectus, and it reads, Tragically, the massive body of descriptive and analytical writing that exists today that, that masquerades as valid human social history is inadequate, ambiguous, inaccurate, and contains an enormous amount of irrelevant information. <laughs> <laughs> so you like that, don't you? I do. <laughs> See, this is almost, this in almost all cases is a result of what is being lo looked at and what is being blah, blah, blah. And we'll go down to the other part of the next paragraph. <laughs> Uncritical social history is inadequate because it excludes certain crucial events as well as certain forms of social relations. Most particularly, they exclude non-hierarchical social relations as well as the dynamics and social processes that sustain enormously diverse stateless societies. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying basically there is they have it all wrong. They're looking at the wrong thing. Y'all know who Hammurabi is and who who Genghis Khan is, and all these these creeps. They, they, they basically are, are people's so, uh, social history threw up. And they represent the pinnacle of these hierarchical societies. And these hierarchical societies represent a very small portion of human history. The real history lies in the stateless societies that they were trying to suck up and that's what they were doing. They were sucking them up all over the place. Not only should these people not be uh, glorified, 
they should be villainized because they're part of states that were sucking, sucking up stuff all over. But the people were struggling against back and forth and back and forth. So what I've done in the next section, <clears throat> good, good, we do, do, we're doing good. Mm. But anyway, this book has two sections. It has a section where there's a series of essays which go to the orientation of the book. And then the last section, I choose two highly, uh, one, two, three, four highly venerated uh, uh, social formations that people call, that I've called classical empires. And I show you how they rose, how they fell, and how they're being influenced, how their influence is being exerted through uh, the big religions of our time, even in our time. And I spent a lot of time on the Greco-Roman civilization because they were the ones that we get the language and all the food and everything from. But I, I show how this was on a, on a Phoenician platform. And, uh, you know, basically give people stuff to think about. But what it, what it basically does is it, it implores you to study the unstudied, flat, or stateless societies that were part of all our histories. And we need to pick through that and find out how direct democracy is more of a part of human history than hierarchy is. Because people say when I say, well, well the way we get past this, uh, this capitalist society and nation states is we have, to, we have to talk about direct democracy at the local level. They say, well, where, where did that ever exist? Hell, it exists all around you. You know, people associated with one another on a volunteer basis. People do it always. Like, I'll give you an example that I just now figured out. You know, you have to figure this stuff out as you go. <clears throat> you remember the pan, you remember the, um, the, um, you, I know you know the pandemic, but you remember the, the <laughs> opioid, the opioid, what was it, what is it called? The crack cocaine uh, epidemic in the black community. Mm -hmm. And you remember how the president's wife was saying, just say no to drugs. That was the Bush was his answer to it. <laughs> but but black people, young black people through hip hop music, through all that kind of stuff, organized themselves. And there's no longer there's no longer a crack epidemic in our community anymore. It's gone. And we don't even see it. You wonder where, where what happened? Well, the example that I used to like to give is during the Detroit Rebellion. Oh, yeah, yeah that's a good one. This is in the first book, uh, Pan African Social Ecology, by the way. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. In the Detroit Rebellion, I was in Canada because I didn't, I didn't fight in the Vietnam War. I went to Canada. And I, I, and I, and I realized, that, I mean, hell, I, I went to Canada in 1965. And if I do the research, I, I was one of the first ones who went up there. But I didn't know that. I mean, hell, I was doing what I thought I needed to do. <clears throat> but anyway, I had a cousin named Sam who lived right off the... Uh, 12th Street. 12th Street is now uh, Rosa Parks Boulevard. But anyway, 12th Street was the epicenter of the 1967 rebellion, as the history records it, as their history records it. So I went over, I, I've tried to get in during the rebellion itself, but the border was closed, so I couldn't get in. I could see Detroit, you know, from the, from the Ambassador Bridge up in smoke, you know. Y'all know Detroit? Oh, okay. And I finally got in after the thing was settled and the policeman had, 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 had basically uh, uh, repressed the uh, social motion. So I went to Sam's house and I said, Sam, what happened? He said, man, the niggas went crazy. I said, was that right? I said, what happened? He said, you know that store up on the corner? They took all the food out of the store. I said, what'd they do with the food? Well, they gave it to the old ladies down the street. <laughs> I said, well, who else did they give it to? They gave it to the old ladies first. I said, Sam, did you get any? He said, well, they didn't give me too much. <laughs> I said, Sam, how long did it take them to do that? He said, they went into that store, and within four hours, all the food was gone. I said, how did they do that? 
He said they had chains, the lines, passing things out, passing things. Well, how did they give it to all these people? So they had go carts walking up, driving them down the street, giving them to people. <laughs> you know? I said, Sam, these people did that themselves, didn't they? They didn't know what they were doing. They just were having, they just were out there yelling and screaming. But that was self-organization. Nobody writes about it. Nobody even sees it. They just see the police come in and all that. <laughs> and, you, and you feel bad about it sometimes when you see things right in front of you and you realize that I missed it. I missed it. But it's, it's all around. It's, like, it's not mystical. Mm. Just like I say in my, in my manuscript, I said, <clears throat> this is one of my best lines, I think. <laughs> 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 you really want to make it. <laughs> my best line is, I said, after all, the... Uh, the unknown is the temporarily hidden. Mm-hmm. That's a good line. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what page is on, but it's in the new manuscript. So I want to ask y'all to look at these and read the new book when hopefully y'all will invite us back next year. We'll have that manuscript in place. And I'll be glad to share it with you. Uh, I wish I could give it to you, but it costs. It costs money. It costs money. <laughs> So I hope I kind of like pointed us in a direction. We almost halfway down. Right? Point out. You want to say something else? Man? I just wanted. I wanted to ask you just a, a quick follow-up question. Yeah. Um, See, that's why I need him. I was just to clarify a couple points on on two terms: uh, critical historiography yeah. and direct democracy. Then specifically looking at critical historiography. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about Fort Mose, since we do have that book with us, yeah. and and kind of let people know who aren't familiar with the book, why studying Fort Mose in the way that you did is an exercise in critical historiography. Because there's one way that this, the history is written, yeah, it is. and there's a, a whole other way that you're approaching that story, yeah. which leads to a different set of conclusions about how that site organized itself. Yeah. The, 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 the non-critical historiography of the, the Fort Mose site is that it was uh, Spanish organized, the Spanish organized this community in front of the uh, St. Augustine for, for security purpose. And that these people had nothing to do with it, but they were, they were, they were the Spanish organized it themselves. The Spanish governors, Montiani and these other guys, they decided that they needed to have this buffer zone there to protect themselves against the uh, British incursion coming south. And uh, they, they even, even from the beginning, these people who formed Fort Mose left Charlestown. That's what it was Charlestown then. Well, we should clarify, just in case anybody's not familiar, Fort Mose is a, was a fort just two miles north of St. Augustine in Florida, in Spanish Florida. So. And you can see it, you, you can, that's another important point. You can see it, it's actually preserved by some local historians who are not trained in, in academia. They self-organize they organize themselves to preserve that site. So that's an exercise in self-organization, self-motion right there. And uh, the story is that when these people came, the Spanish gave them sanctuary when they became Catholics. What, what, what was happening was so many people were coming, they had to do something with the people. So what they did is uh, put one of the cap in charge of trying to create something away from the site, away from direct, Fort, direct St. Augustine, and they were forced to change the policy. That's another important point. Another important point. The state does not make policy on its own. It is forced to make that policy from below. You know, it it it, it, uh, it has to do it. In order to maintain itself, it has to do it. You know. And uh, Andrew, you want to say something else about that? Yeah, I mean, just just to clarify what you were just saying. So we have you have this this migration of people fleeing slavery in yep. the Carolina colonies coming through the territory that would eventually become Georgia, but yeah. was not Georgia yet. It was contested area. It was a contested area. Um, and settling just Probably come right through my hometown, probably. Probably did, yeah. yeah. Probably, <laughs> probably right, right down through there. What is now 95. Yeah. <laughs> um,
and coming right to a, a, and settling in a town just two miles north of St. Augustine, which was the major uh, uh, urban Spanish development of, of, of yeah, Spanish colonial urban Spanish. development. Now, one thing that, uh, that, so just to get at what you were saying about the different ways that that story is told, is that when you hear the story of Fort Mose from anybody else besides Motivo, um, what you're going to hear is that this was, uh, like he said, a Spanish policy, right? Um, that was made to entice people to move south to escape slavery in order to e economically to screw with the British, right? Yeah. yeah. Which is definitely an effect of, of people fleeing slavery and, and moving south to Spanish Florida. But Modibo's contention is that that this migration was already mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. And um, and the specific reasons that are laid out in the in the book as to why people is it's very important to know that the first underground railroad went south, not north. Yeah, um, and then to to um, oh shoot. And then and then the other thing is about, about the Seminole. Yeah. The Seminoles are actually not native people in the truest sense. That that, that the state policy made them native so that they can remove this uh -huh. integrated uh, I think you make that point, sir. Y'all make that point. Yeah, y'all make that point in your book. Uh, I, I'm very influenced by these two writers over here. They they I, I read their stuff. It's, I hope y'all put some more shit out. <laughs> <laughs> but but so um the four, one thing that you never hear in a lot of the books on Fort Mose is where this name Mose comes from. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's written M-O-S-E and no accent on the E or anything like that. And everybody's, okay, it's Spanish, so we'll pronounce that Mose. And um, because they assume it's a Spanish name. Mm. Um, but it's not a Spanish name. Um, and the, the, if you look at the old maps, which we did in the book, and we got we found, we found yeah. some good old maps on, on uh, around, and we uh, even found some other historians well, one other historian who had commented on this, um, that if you look at the old maps, the English maps, they call it Fort Musa, M-O-O-S-A. And then there's another Spanish map that calls it Fort Musa, M-U-S-A. Musa being the Arabic for Moses, right? Um, and so these were people from West Africa who were Muslims, who had been kidnapped, trafficked, enslaved, and escaped. And named their city that they founded Fort Musa. And just that one fact alone tells you a lot more about what this community was and the, the self-organization behind it. And it, and, it, and it dismantles this whole idea of it being a, a, a state project from Spain. And so and in the history of like of uh, Maroon communities that we read, sometimes Fort Mose is skipped over and not considered a maroon community because of its relationship to the state, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Um, and I think that's uh, not fair, and I think that it's it's an inaccurate way to. I, I mean, I think that it's it's certainly a, a different and more urban maroon community, but a maroon community nonetheless. What well, well, I'm asking for y'all is helping you in writing this new, new, new uh, critical this new history. This, uh, this history that is uh, critical historiography because we got a lot of work to do because it's all that stuff it's all it's just inverted it's upside down because you know? because there are people even the people who call themselves revolutionary nationalists and all that they draw on this this um, this this uh, tradition of hierarchy to justify what they do. And, but that's not human history at all. Human history is made up of people organizing themselves in a non-hierarchical fashion and resisting the state at every turn. And the, and the state wins sometimes. Sometimes they lose. And the times that they lose, and you can see it in the state. You, you know, they always say, yes, and we were invaded by these barbarians from the mountain. <laughs> or these barbarians from... It's just, like, <clears throat> just like if you read the Levant, they, they, they don't even know what the hell these people were. These people organized in all of these islands in the Mediterranean. They call them the sea people. Yeah. Came over and knocked out all of them states. Knock, knocked flat in their asses right on out, you know. <laughs> but then they say, oh, this is a dark age. <laughs> you know, dark ages of curtain descended 
or pulling whatever, whichever. <laughs> but these were the, the times when the people were really, uh, you know, organizing and working together in all kinds of uh, human uh, ingenuity and even science emerged from that kind of context. Even the women, well, you know, who were uh, regarded as witches and stuff, they were actually doing all kinds of medicinal things in these contexts. So we need to write that. That's what we need to write. And be careful, because sometimes, sometimes you think you're writing something and it's so, it's so severe. I remember one time I was <laughs> writing some shit. I was just writing, I said, man, I'm going, then I stopped back and reading. I said, I'm going back right with it. <laughs> it it's not there, you know what I mean? I, I saw hierarchy in my own stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you got to start all over again. Mm -hmm. get, to get it out of there. Mm -hmm. I want to hear what y'all got to say. I usually begin these sessions with asking people questions about what they believe and how many y'all believe Hammurabi was a great king. You know, I kind of wish it like that. But I don't have to ask you. I know where y'all are. <laughs> I don't have to ask. My, just, just handle the uh, Q&A. Yeah, well, let's, well let's, uh, let's open it up. Does anybody have any thoughts? I know we're, we're a little informal today. So uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Is there anything... Spark anybody's interest or have any questions from Odebo? Let's see a hand right back. For anybody in the room, really. What does direct democracy mean to you? Direct democracy when people sit down together, face to face, and govern themselves uh, by collective decision making of one, you know, you know, whatever they come up with. They solving their own problems. It's equal. It's intimate, and you have to know the people. I mean, you, you got to know who, who their mama is, what they did, what their motivation is, and then you, you can come up with a decision. And, and what I'm proposing, that we go to these city councils and all these things. And by the way, I'm, I'm glad y'all having this in, this in this library. Well, we need to reclaim these spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, the taxpayers, it's taxpayers' money. The library people, they love it, you know what I mean? And they like to see people coming forward to have book fairs in their library, because it's your library. Mm -hmm. So direct democracy means uh, an institutionalized mechanism by which everybody has an equal say and an equal uh, influence in directing the motion of the society which they're a part of. Not no, it's, it's not representative democracy now. I just, first thing I do, I juxtapose it in this new book. I juxtapose it between direct democracy and representative democracy. No intervening representative, no corruption, no layer of people who know or know it all and who come down and just listen to you. You're the ones who are telling them what to do. You know? There is an excellent book that we actually were privileged enough to be featured in that uh, Cindy Milstein edited called Deciding for Ourselves, yeah. The Promise of Direct Democracy. And they probably have a good firestorm. Uh, it's in there. Sorry? Oh, it's in Oh, yeah, it's in there. That's my favorite, my favorite book ever. So I'm going to go to firestorm and get a copy of Deciding for Ourselves. And uh, some great examples of modern day, real life, direct democracy in action. And hopefully you love it. I don't know. And, 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 practice, and practice and get it. Because sometimes, yeah. sometimes you practice and you you, you mess up, you know, so you have to correct it, correct it, too, when you mess up. Do you want to talk at all a little bit about, you, you alluded to it a second ago, but that social intimacy and why you came up with this term, intimate direct democracy? Well, it's intimate because people have to know one another. Like, like the Seminole, well, the Seminole is actually <clears throat> influenced by the, uh, by the Muskogee. And the Muskogee, they, the, the anthropologists say the Muskogee are the matriarchal society. Because the uh, matriarch chooses the uh, uh, Miko. Miko. And Miko is, uh, they call him a chief, but he ain't no chief. He's just a, a person who uh, sits in the council and listens. And, you know, he's just, uh, he's, he's a proto administrator, is what he is. <laughs> what are you laughing at? That's all he is. Because uh, sometimes uh, in those gatherings, these people don't even listen to the Miko. Yeah. You know? And, 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 and but, but the point is that these people who appoint the Miko, or at least they consult in the appointment of the Miko, is, the, uh, is the one of the older women in the society. And they know the kids. They know what they were like when they were kids. They know he was a thief when he was a child, you know what I mean? So he don't get to be the Miko, you know what I mean? 
So that's the way that those societies work. And, and, and I talk about the, um, I know y'all know about Cahokia. You know, me and my, my lover Janice, we went over to see Cahokia. It's on the side of the, um, how many of y'all have been to Cahokia? You've been to Cahokia? That's great. That's great. Now that was a great hierarchical society. Yeah. Like Okamogi. Like Okamogi, yeah. yeah. Real hierarchical society. I mean, they had top, I mean, it was, <laughs> but anyway, these societies, you can, and the, and the anthropological data shows that people were fleeing those kind of societies, you know, as opposed to going there and joining them. I mean, it, 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 societies were unstable, people were being punished, people left there. And you see traces of those societies up and down the rivers, that's why the Creek Indians were called Creek, but they're really Muskogee. But, uh, you know, the, the, and, and you see it in West Africa, too. Like my, my black, 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 pan-African friends, oh, we had great kings and queens. You, you're being trapped. We're, we're not for kings and queens, whatever color they are. We had, we had, the, we had the great society of Ghana, Mali, and some guy. And the archaeological record shows that people were running to the coast trying to get away from these people. You know, great men, Musa, the richest man in the world. Who the hell want to know about that? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, you know, irrelevance. <laughs> men, <Mensa> Musa, <laughs> he had a hundred elephants. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge part of the intimate direct democracy. What, what Modibo does in that book is he shows that this eastward migration of people away from centers of, of hierarchical governance in the Americas and the westward migration both towards the coasts, right? Uh, that was happening in West Africa at the same time. At the same time. On different continents. And these and because of the the after, Due to the violence of, of colonialism and, and slavery, um, these democratic tendencies in both of these, you know, emerging from these two different places, these indigenous democratic tendencies meet each other. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just maroon. Yeah, yeah, and they yeah. and they work it out, and they. It's just an amazing story. I mean, it's so, it's so beautiful, you know, when you when you know it, you know. And, and Honestly, nobody else in the world but you would have, would have. No, no, no. There are people who could see that shit. I mean, it just didn't, I wrote it down. I wrote it down, and you edited it, and we got it here, and we talking about it. That's I was trying to do something. No, but it's not the only. No. <laughs> <laughs> see, don't see, we can talk like that. You know. I don't often get to hear you, Modibo, talk about kind of your thoughts. Y'all yeah, know Sarah Lee. On, no. <laughs> Everybody know her. Sarah Lee. <laughs> but, she's, one of, she's one of the uh, uh, most influential contemporary writers of uh, direct democratic contemporary history around. <laughs> no, you don't. You are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe if I stop being a nurse, I can write something. But, uh, <laughs> For sure. Uh, you know. I, I haven't really gotten to hear you talk a lot about the situation, a lot of the situations going on in Georgia right now. And I think one, I mean, I, I am really interested in what you think about the future of what we have left in the struggle in, against Cop City, but I'm also wondering, like, given all of the history that you've helped unearth and really just, like, pull together to help us, like, actually think about even how to think about Port Mose, not just, like, pass it along and be like, oh, there's some site, is mm -hmm. with what's coming up, um, the threat of Okefenokee in oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I'm just like which you could give us some background but really like I mean what do you think what do you think it would really take for for um, you know Okefenokee to not get mined for the sea islands to be returned to the descendants of the enslaved and colonized for a cop city not to get built like what do you really think it's going to take in this moment and, and using all of that kind of like history that you've shared with us about that's so specific to Southeast Georgia to Atlanta, like, where do you see us going with these struggles? How can we win? Well, first, well, winning and losing is a, is a long-term proposition. Yes. Um, but first, I think we ought to congratulate the people who have developed this campaign to uh, save the Atlanta forest. That, that's, that's one of the, that, that will prove to be that will prove to be one of our most significant campaigns in this period. I, I don't have any doubt about it. 
because there's so many layers coming together and, and, and conge congealing over the question. And I think what is happening, just to give you an idea, they have overcome the civil rights petty bourgeoisie and their backwardness in the spirit. If you overcome that, then you're going a long ways. Because they're scared now. They're backing away. They're black backing away. But you have to keep the pressure on. And I'm not a, I'm not a prophet or a soothsayer or nothing, but I've never seen anything as promising as this. You know, and, and everybody understand it. And the thing that I love about it, it is the young people that's doing it. There's not no old crackpot uh, preachers, which are, which, are all the, which are all the streets in the city of Atlanta named after. <laughs> and that's a bad situation there. You know, between the crackpot preachers who are having the streets named after them and the Stone Mountain named after the, these damn Confederates up on the wall, uh, you know, all of this stuff is going to be wiped away after a while. But it's a long-term struggle. And it's not the day or tomorrow, one fine day. It's going to take many different turns. It's going to take much frustration and much anguish and a whole lot of elation when you win a little bit. So uh, the dynamic of back and forth, uh, I, I think we, we, we're in a good position. We're good, I think people understand it. But now on the, on the Okefenokee. The Okefenokee is remote, and the people around there are small town, city, municipalities are bought off. But, you know, we've been down there. We stayed, there was another mining group that was going in about eight, ten years ago. And I, and I got a, I got a, I got a crackpot preacher <laughs> who's a comrade of mine. <laughs> Some crackpot preachers can scare people, and so this one, this one, they, the Reverend Zach lied. Yeah, yeah. We went down there and, and raised a little hell, and that postponed it a little bit. But they come back uh -huh. because there's money to be made from that kind of stuff, especially now. And that's the price. Now this is the, the, the dilemma and the conundrum. On the one hand, we want to. Uh, increase uh, or decrease fossil fuel and increase clean energy mm -hmm. and that requires all kinds of um, uh, elements like tritti not tritium but uh, cobalt and all these other kinds of things which can be mined and people can make money from and uh, one of them unfortunately or two of them unfortunately can be mined out of the Okefenokee but once we realize that the quality of life is going to be increased by having a clean planet. And um, the people who are from the outside, they, they tried to pull the thing about being from the outside. Well, uh, what do you want us? We can't bleed, breathe your air? <laughs> you can't, we, can't, uh, we can't drink your water? But the point is, it's a, it's a long-term struggle, and it goes from generation to generation. And new generations will bring us closer to uh, a new understanding of it all. Because there's some blind alleys we can go up and uh, cause great catastrophic danger, not damage. So we have to be careful. And we have to write this stuff. But once we write the history down and show that people, everyday ordinary people, are the ones who make history, then they can see themselves. See, well, what, what, all we got to do, we don't, we don't want to tell the people to do this or that or to lead, grab the people by the hand and lead. We want to just put a mirror up to them so they can see who they are and what they did and what they must do. Once they see that, then they can understand. And, and, and you, you don't need to just step aside and uh, join in. <laughs> we, have, we, we have a, a piece of writing in the works dealing with Obi um that's trying to accomplish this. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. um, but like, I think that it would be and it's, it's, it's necessary, I mean, the, the ecological destruction around Cup City is obviously horrible. The potential for what is going to happen at Oki Finoki is, yeah. yeah, it's unparalleled. This yeah. is one of the last um, uh, intact freshwater ecosystems on the planet, not in North America, not in Georgia, on planet Earth, that's still functioning in a, in a way relatively similar to the way it was prior to the Industrial Revolution, which is, I believe, the standard um, for how you determine an intact freshwater ecosystem. Um, obviously, a ton of drinking water comes from there, but there's also a, a lot of uh, uh, 
several species that make their home there, including some uh, endangered species. Um, a lot. And on the social aspect, it's really important to know that um, the Okefenokee was one of these places in this contested area that became Georgia, but the Okefenokee was a place where people sought refuge. Mm -hmm. um, it was really the gateway to the Suwannee River for uh, uh, Maroons and, and people fleeing slavery. Um, basically, there's two rivers. Like, there's a St. Mary's that goes out to the, to the sea, yeah, which, by the way, anything that happens at Okefenokee ends up screwing up Cumberland Island, which is a, another protected area uh, just downriver. Um, and then the, the other river is the Suwannee River, which goes down uh, through Florida. Now, if you look at, there's some great maps in a book I'm reading right now, and we'll probably talk more about this at another event at some point, but look at, you can look at maps of uh, maroon communities in Florida just going right down the Swanee River. Um, and, then, and then even further, once those folks uh, began to be threatened, they moved even further south um, by sea. But the, uh, like, that whole area has such a history of struggle, such a rich history of struggle, and a multiracial struggle. And the, these, these communities that lived there, it was, it, there were people fleeing uh, slavery, African people fle fleeing slavery, there were indigenous people who were, uh, who were at first like the Timakua, yeah. right, and then and, and Muskogee. Um, the they, Timakua are older, yes. old, older uh, uh, groupings. And, and, there, and there's remarkable gender history there as well, you know. They were, the, the Timakua, you know, the Spanish were like, we don't know what's going on with gender here, but, you know, it's like they couldn't figure it out. But, they, yeah, but it's, yeah. it's really fascinating. You should look at it. There's a huge two-spirit history in the area. And um, and that that history of the Okefenokee is it's known. There's stuff written about it, but it, it hasn't really been presented as part of the effort to preserve that site, at least as far as I've seen it. And I think that like part of the struggle is going to be presenting the people, like the people down there right now. If you go down to the Okefenokee and uh, like Waycross and uh, Folkston, it's, I mean it's it's Trumpville down there, like no joke. Right, and so it's going to take people thinking and learning about how to engage with folks in this community because while they might be like objectionable folks in a lot of ways, they also don't want to lose the Okefenokee, and they're very concerned about it. Um, so it's just maybe even with their kids, like if they have access to stories from this place that are that show these these multifaceted liberation movies that, that again and again and again kept happening in that area, like, you know, I think that's a resource that can be brought to bear. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very important that y'all do the writing from a critical ecological perspective and a critical historiographic perspective. It's, it's needed. It's yeah. needed. Got a question right there. Thank you so much for the talk. I'm kind of curious, you mentioned a couple of case studies in the book, like the idea of the migration. But what other type of historiographic examples are you talking about? Specifically, you brought up this idea of showing a mirror to the masses. Are there other examples of that in the upcoming book? The upcoming one. In the second section, I choose four uh, empires that you know about. I mean, real empires. Now, I don't mean, like, that's another weakness of the older literature. They, anytime there's a amalgamation of several different nations, uh, city-states, they call it. The guy who controls all three or all four of them is called an emperor or empire. But what I'm talking about is the ones that emerged out of Qin, uh, uh, Qin and Han, China, where you got uh, you know, four or five million people coming together and being administered through state religions and all that kind of stuff. And that's one example. Another example is, um, well, I used the Achaemenid Empire, which was, which was the ancient Persian Empire. Then I show how they were, uh, that sucked up a lot of uh, uh, other nations, uh, other uh, small tribal identity groups around to make up that administered, but they had to be administered through these great religions. And I, I, uh, I talk about the great religions, the, the great Western religions, the monotheistic religions of ancient uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam. Those are the, those are that, that's the same religious tree. And then I talk about Hinduism and, and Vedic writing and stuff. And I show how they use that to mobilize people and uh, and break down 
these um, flat societies that they had to mobilize. Now, another thing they had to do, and you can see it resound, resonated in, this, in the questions of our own time, they had to, all these religions had to use women's bodies because, and it's really, it's really no, no real question in my mind about it, because they were not industrialized, they used manual labor. So you had to have a massive amount of manual labor, and they used women's bodies to create this. Not only did they use women's bodies, they used the artisans. And so if one, if they wanted to, to, to decimate a flat, a flat society, they went out went and, and killed all the men and grabbed the women, because they were using them for, for laborers and bodies, and then they would take the artisans and pay them off. And then, and then they created, they simulated them into hierarchies. And so I, so I, I demonstrate that process and how it takes place in, in these uh, various regions, including the Greco-Roman Empire. And, and the Greco-Roman Empire was the worst of them all. You know, and, and I, I, I mean, I go, I mean, I liked what I did there. I really, I really did, because I, I said, shit, man, this, <laughs> this, this stuff is still resonating, you know. And once, once people see that it's resonated from situations like that, because see, most people will look at history and they'll say, well, I know Roman history because I knew about old Julius Caesar and, and uh, you know, hell, Julius Caesar wasn't shit. The, the point is, <laughs> they, had, they had consolidated a massive empire. And these people were buying and selling some of everything, women, children, everything. And so I, I even say in the, in the introduction to the second part, I say what has been presented to us is a cavalcade of individual heroes, and I don't spare nobody. I mean, I talk about Ragnar. I, talk, I mean, I, I mention them all in a list. And I say they're all equally unimportant. <laughs> <laughs> I put Hitler, Ragnar, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, all of them in there. <laughs> I had some fun with this. See, I, if I was to present this, if I was in a school and I tried to present this as a thesis, I wouldn't get the people would say I was damn went crazy. <laughs> and that's why we publish our own stuff. No, we're gonna be like that shit off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we gotta wrap up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but y'all been a good group now. And by the way, if you want some more books, we can sell some more books. We're here to sell books. <laughs> so I guess we got to close out, right? Thank you very much. So sorry. So sorry. I'm, glad that I'm sorry to see this in like this. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. We, um... And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Well, we've gotten Thanksgiving out of the way, and we're officially into the crapulous consumer season. But this year feels a little different. You may have noticed, as your insufferable relatives talked around mouthfuls of turkey and stuffing, about the unjust persecution of Donald Trump or Israel's need to preemptively nuke Iran, that the world didn't just slide easily into Black Friday this year. The first signal was the interruption of the traditional Macy's genocide parade as heroic protesters in support of Palestine blocked the parade route and kept the balloons floating in place for about three minutes until New York's fascists could drag the protesters away. Can't think of a time when that happened before. Then, you may all have noticed all those cops and security guards everywhere. As I described a few weeks ago, capitalism is on the brink of collapse, losing billions to flash robberies and smashing grabs across the country. In response to losing untold billions, the corporate greed barons have now invested untold millions in security guards and cameras in an effort to stop the bleeding. This isn't cause to despair, however. This is cause to celebrate. After flash robbers reached into corporate America's pockets and cut their obscene profit margins, those corporations are now pulling money out of their own pockets and cutting into their own obscene profit margins. And if we're smart, 
All that investment in security won't do them any good. We just have to get bigger and smarter. It's good, perhaps, to set up diversions before your Santa raids hit the shelves. Maybe a faked epileptic seizure. That usually rattles store clerks and security alike. You just have to hit the floor and flop a lot. Maybe put an Alka-Seltzer in your mouth to duplicate the foaming. That's a nice touch. And then all your friends hit the shelves. Now, I've been asked over the holidays by relatives of my own, why would I advocate for widespread flash robberies? They remind me that stealing is wrong, and I was raised not to steal. And I agree, stealing is wrong. And that's why I oppose capitalism, because capitalism is theft. What entrepreneurs call profit is always 100% of the time the boss skimming from the value of the worker's labor. And I can prove it. Imagine I'm a rich bastard setting up a chocolate factory. I pay you to do the labor. You go out and get the factory, the machinery, the ingredients, the packaging. That costs me a million dollars. You then single-handedly work the assembly line and crank out chocolate bars and transport them to the market. At first, you put a $2 price tag on the chocolate bars, and nobody buys them. Everybody buys our competition's chocolate bars at $1.75. You know why? The consumer determines the value of a thing. That's an important law in capitalism. It goes back to Adam Smith and Wealth of Nations. The consumer determines the value of a thing. Don't forget that. There's a test later. So, your valuation of our chocolate bars at $2 leaves us with zero sales. What do you do next? You drop the price to a buck fifty. Once you do that, our product flies off the shelf. You walk away with everything sold, and you've got a pocket full of cash. You've got two million dollars. Now, pay close attention to what happens next. You return to me, and you hand me a million dollars that covers my initial investment. Remember, that's what I paid for, the factory, the ingredients, and so on. And after I'm repaid that million dollars, there's still a million left. So the question arises, why did the consumer collectively give that million dollars to you? What is it that they valued at a million dollars? We know it isn't the factory or the ingredients or the machinery and so on, because that's been paid for. So what's the only remaining variable? What's the last thing that went into the final product that they bought? The answer, of course, is your labor. The consumer determined your labor was worth a million dollars. And let's not forget, who determines the value? The consumer. So your labor was worth a million dollars. The consumer said so. Unfortunately, I'm your boss, and I decided your labor was worth 50 grand. And I put the rest in my pocket and call it profit. See how that works? And you let me do it. You let me rob you repeatedly, because a job where you get robbed is better than starving under a bridge. I hold you hostage and rob you. Welcome to capitalism. So, the whole economic structure is a flim-flam, a means for the wealthy few to rob everyone who must sweat and bleed to sustain themselves. And since the entire structure is organized robbery, I see nothing immoral about robbing the robbers. Now, in fairness, folks have also told me that two wrongs don't make a right. I have two responses to that. First, two wrongs have a better chance of making a right than one wrong does. One wrong is definitely a wrong. Two wrongs, well, they might be a right. And second, just an observation here, but folks who typically say two wrongs don't make a right are the very people who profit or benefit from the initial solitary wrong. So my advice is, if anyone tells you two wrongs don't make a right, you should probably punch them in the face and take their wallet. 
they probably did something to you that you haven't discovered yet. Flash robberies are the ultimate veto, an attack on a structure of injustice. Perhaps if we steal enough of their stuff, capitalists will get the hint and stop trying to sell it. Then the larger robbery grinds to a halt. Besides, taking it is a lot more fun. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you and 50 of your closest friends are flash robbing the corporate masters and causing the system to doom spiral over the holidays, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A24. 3205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case hear his past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org This is the Final Straw Radio The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.